Hi, my name is Sharman. I'm a person in sustained recovery from substance use disorder and mental illness. I'm the executive director here at the Connection Cafe in Fayette County. We are a grassroots organization that is a harm reduction focused community with the intention to remove barriers for individuals leaving incarceration or those that have substance use disorder and or mental illness. Hi, my name is Rebecca Gurrell and I'm the manager of the Indiana Recovery Network. My role is to oversee grants and help manage projects. I'm also a person in sustained recovery from mental health and substance use disorders. Historically in the United States, recovery has always been abstinence based. That's the most well-known form of recovery. That means not using any substance at all. So when it comes to recovery, the term abstinence is that you don't use any mind-altering substances. And if you do, then you've lost your recovery. It did originally start with Alcoholics Anonymous in 1935. Later on in the 1950s, this model was picked up, which followed the 12-step program and the model became the basis for 90% of treatment programs in the United States. There are a lot of challenges and barriers for individuals when um, they try abstinence-based recovery or if that's the only form of recovery that they're offered. We don't tell the person who smokes, you need to quit cold turkey today. We offer them cessation programs so that they can slowly stop smoking, treating the person holistically, not just by you know taking away what they're doing. We need to find out why they're doing it and get to the bottom of that cause so we can start treating the root cause of the problem. I cycled in and out of active use for almost three decades of my life. And during that time, I had, had two children of my own. And what I did was I continued to repeat cycles the same dysfunctional cycle that I was raised into. My first go around with recovery, um, I was involved with the Department of Child Services and the justice system. And the only options that I was given to find recovery was an abstinence-based program. I had to follow a strict schedule of attending meetings. I had to have meeting sheets signed. And it was really difficult because I was a single mom at the time. I was working full time and I was trying to, you know, make visits with my daughter. And, you know, the expectations were very high with very little support. And we know that with recovery, like anything else, it's a process of change. So the stigma that's associated with it, uh, the punishment, the consequences through the correctional system, are all pieces that individuals face if they don't get it right the first time. What works for one might not work for another, and it also varies a lot depending on the cultural aspects of your community or where you live, if you're in an urban area versus a rural area. So again, recovery is not one size fits all. From my own experience, I wasn't able to follow that linear pathway where I was instructed to go to 12-step meetings, get a sponsor, and my life was gonna be happily ever after. For me, I had multiple overdoses, multiple suicide attempts. In my mind, I was a failure, whether it be from lack of transportation to get to a meeting, a family that was able to support me or even understood. And today, we have many other options and resources for recovery. We've recognized that there are multiple pathways to recovery and that not everyone recovers the same. What we see is so many people have found freedom, they've found a voice, and they're able to talk about their recovery. And owning our own recovery has not only gave us power as individuals, but it also shows another person that it can be done. These multiple pathways can include the abstinence-based model, where it can include a moderation-based recovery, where an individual, you know, eventually maybe they slow down to only using that substance on the weekends and eventually stopping. Harm reduction is a broad concept for protecting life in several ways, including limiting or reducing the likelihood of danger or death. A lot of harm reduction organizations aim to work with individuals to get them into that no longer chaotic use. Another pathway to recovery is solo and natural recovery where an individual utilizes their existing family supports and um, you know sometimes that can include their church community or their friend groups. 
So there are many different pathways to recovery. Those are just a few. We see individuals that have more opportunity through choice and they live and they're able to work through those traumas and they're able to obtain the quality of life that they want to live and not what that abstinence-based model says is the only way. And it's also important to remember that most individuals try out at least two different pathways before they find the pathway that fits best for them. The way we define harm reduction is truly meeting people where they're at, recognizing that not everyone is ready to stop using substances. It's not about the services that we want to give them, it's about the services that they want, and sometimes that means providing food resources to an individual, sometimes it's a sleeping bag. And so for us, the goal is to reduce the harms that the substance causes. Harm reduction isn't a new concept. There's examples of it dating back to the 1960s. A common example of using harm reduction to treat substance use disorder would be using nicotine patches to treat smoking. It's over the counter, it's readily available, and it's highly encouraged by doctors. So it's always about the small changes. But what we know is individuals that we're able to build that relationship with um, as they start to trust us, that statistically they're five times more likely to enter in some form of treatment. Harm reduction covers a multitude of things that sometimes people don't necessarily think about. It can range from anything from uh, supplies that we give or just love and support that they need. For example, wound care kits, safer sex supplies, HIV testing, Hep C testing and referrals, telehealth services, uh, helping individuals get their GED, providing a space for someone to come to, to have a warm meal, a shower, and getting clothing. Maybe that's all we get to do for that individual for that day. But the biggest thing that we provide is unconditional support without stigma and judgment. There are a lot of myths and misunderstandings of what harm reduction really is. A common myth about harm reduction is that it encourages or enables individuals to continue using. We know this isn't true because when individuals engage with harm reduction services, they're more likely to participate in recovery services and eventually stop using altogether. So the myths surrounding that harm reduction enables people or allows them to continue using it, that's something that we hear often. Just because we want someone to stop using the substance doesn't mean they will. So until someone makes a decision to change that, then uh, what we get to do is support them in that pathway and help them reduce the harms within themselves. Another myth is that harm reduction is a waste of money and resources. We know that harm reduction services are not a waste of money um, or resources because the services that are provided through these organizations help eliminate barriers um, for individuals being able to access treatment and recovery resources. I think about my own life and, and my own journey. I know what it's like to be called worthless and that I didn't deserve my children in uh, that they should just let me die, that I would never learn. Everyone deserves a chance. And I don't care what that looks like, but if we have the tools to save someone's life, that's our obligation to another human being. Another myth is that harm reduction programs and services make communities unsafe. Harm reduction organizations actually can make communities safer by being a safe space for individuals to gather. The data shows that harm reduction services being in a community doesn't cause more syringe litter. In fact, most of our programs go out and pick up syringe litter or we do more community cleanups. They also give back to communities. Sometimes they hold holiday toy drives. They also can um, provide individuals access to other recovery supports and services 
and referrals into treatment programs if that's requested. Harm reduction organizations are open to anyone and everyone in the community. You can come in, volunteer, just see what the program is all about, and you'll really get a great understanding of what these programs have to offer. So for anyone uh, that has questions or that would like to get involved with harm reduction in your community, I would recommend uh, reaching out to uh, um, a recovery community organization. Get involved with naloxone training or distribution. You could be behind the scenes when it comes to harm reduction services or literally being out there on the streets handing out supplies such as blankets or water. All of those are forms of harm reduction services. With the Connection Cafe, the atmosphere is judgment-free, stigma-free. You can come into the cafe and all of our services are free food, a cup of coffee, play a game of cards, anything from laundry services to HIV and hep C testing. Uh, on a Friday or Saturday night, there may be karaoke going on in the back or live music or a movie playing, or there can be a training going on to help individuals learn how to budget their account. We have a service that comes in and help them file their taxes for free, run their credit scores to see what they might be able to do with their credit or what they need to work on or to even get access to starting back to college. The more services that we can provide out of this space, the more opportunity that gives our individuals. If you want to get involved with any harm reduction efforts or find a harm reduction agency near you, the Indiana Recovery Network website is a resource hub that is based on the four dimensions of recovery. The four dimensions of recovery were created by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. The four dimensions of recovery include health, home, purpose, and community. By addressing the four dimensions of recovery, we're able to treat the person as a whole and not just treating the presenting symptoms of the substance use disorder. So on our website, if you click on resources, there are the four categories and each of those offer services and um, access to resources that fall under those four dimensions. You can also search for recovery resources based on city or zip code so that you can find more local community-based resources. I don't think anybody deserves to die because they have a substance use disorder. I myself almost died from an overdose and thankfully I was revived and was able to continue living. Somebody kept me alive so that I could find my recovery, so now it's my turn to keep others alive too. I know that my children are glad that someone not only saved me once or twice, but multiple times because today I get to wake up every single day and be a mom. I was able to go from uh, um, having a GED that I got as a patient in the state hospital to being 10 classes away from my master's. Substance use disorder can affect people from all walks of life. I was a um, high achieving student. I had a full tuition scholarship to college and substance use disorder still affected my life. I'm now a person in recovery. I've been in recovery for over six years. Recovery is possible and um, there are options out there and help is available. No matter what your traumas are and no matter what your life has looked like up until this point, you get to define what your future looks like by rising above anything that you've ever been through. You can be a cycle breaker in your family and you can do far greater things than what you think you're capable of. What I say is our stories can either be our poison or our power and we get to choose.